Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you uh, very much for coming. I'm Omar Abed, um, and I'm um, privileged to work here at Inside in addiction medicine. And I'm going to be talking this morning on Suboxone, which is um, the brand name for buprenorphine and naloxone. Um, there's other brands and formulations, but I'm just I just titled it like this because it's it's more well known uh, because of marketing and some other reasons. And um, Nadir was telling me that uh, usually the grand rounds are for like 20 to 25 minutes and then there's questions. But he said that it actually goes up to like one hour from 8, uh, 8.30 to 9.30. So I, um, I originally had it like, like 20, 25 minutes, but then I kept kind of thinking, oh, this is an important slide, this is an important slide, and kind of add it up. So feel free to leave whenever you want to, you know, don't uh, feel obliged to stay. I know you all have things to do. And uh, if you have to leave and you want to ask something, then just, like, ask me, you know. Uh, so, um, the agenda for today's Grand Rounds, I want to talk uh, just an overview of opioid use disorder and why we need to use medication for those who fit the criteria for uh, this diagnosis and uh, and why is Suboxone the medication that is, I mean, or buprenorphine plus naloxone, it's a combination uh, drug, why is it used in an office-based setting? And then I'm just going to briefly mention, uh, just like in a slide, why uh, the medication is not sufficient. So just a, 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 a quick clarification on terminology. A lot of people use opioids uh, as, the, uh, as the word when they're describing these particular drugs. Uh, and some people use opiates. And... Um, Opioids is the broader term. Opiates is derived from the actual poppy plant, and, and we get morphine, codeine, and, and, and thebane from that. And opioids is a broader term that includes the opiates, and also it includes semi-synthetic or synthetic drugs. So they like they put different things, like they put like a methyl group or a couple methyl groups, or they make other chemical modifications. Um, the chemists and the, um, and the pharmacologists. So uh, here are some examples of of, of, of drugs that have have been uh, have had some changes on to, uh, on the natural comp, uh, on the natural chemical. <coughs> so like hydrocodone, oxycodone. Uh, fentanyl is completely synthetic. You know, methadone, buprenorphine, which is the main drug we're going to talk about is also an opioid, um, and it's not an opiate because there, there, it has been uh, uh, modified. Uh, uh, Thebane has been modified to make buprenorphine. I think it was, like, discovered, like, in the 1950s or something. Um, okay, um, so opioid use disorder, what is it? Uh, in, uh, simply, it's just the problematic pattern of opioid use that leads to serious impairment or distress. To be diagnosed with it, you need a two or more. Um, you need to meet two or more of of eleven particular symptoms within a twelve month time period, and to uh, Get, uh, provide suboxone or buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, you should have moderate to severe opioid use disorder. So moderate is you need four, four more symptoms. So there's a, 11 symptoms altogether, and those 11 symptoms, they can be categorized in four categories. Loss of control, social problems, Risky use and pharmacological problems. So um, 
I kind of put some quotes so it, it kind of gives an idea like like something that like a, a patient would say that would indicate that you know they, they're having this uh, 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 this problem so for loss of control it, it, it comes in like uh, these four specific criteria either the drug is taken larger the substance well th these actual criterion is actually for substance use disorder you know not just op opioids also alcohol and, and other substances but we're ta we're going to talk about this in the context of of uh, opioid use disorder so I, I just have substance in there but it's uh, we're talking about opioids so if the opioid is taken in larger amounts or for a longer time than than, than in, intended than what the doctor prescribed, mm -hmm. uh, so like let's say a patient is saying I, I, that they didn't mean to take so much initially, so that would be a sign of loss of control. Mm -hmm. Also, if they have this persistent desire to keep to take more and more of it, or they're unsuccessful in cutting mm -hmm. down. Uh, for example, uh, uh, they, they've tried to stop, but they, they keep starting it again and again. That's also indicative. Also, the t amount of time that they spend on it. Some people can, in severe cases, they can be like totally consumed, like how to, how to find this, this drug. Uh, also, this craving, this, they just have this desire to use it. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap between this. Also, they run into uh, social problems. Uh, they're uh, unable to fulfill their obligations, uh, you know, as uh, as a fa as a father, mother, um, and uh, at, and so at work, at school, at home. So, if they say that they keep having trouble at work, or they're having pro uh, relationship problems with a family, with friends. And if they're and they're still using it even despite these problems, that is also a social problem. And an, another um, sign is if they are uh, reducing or neglecting the activities that they that they would normally do. So these are some quotes uh, in in italics. So. Also, another category is risky use. So if they're using it in dangerous situations, uh, because when they use the opioids, it affects their mental status. And uh, like if they're driving or using heavy machinery. Um, so, and also when they realize that it's, it's affecting, their, affecting their cognitive and their psychological uh, state, but they're still using it, this will also be one of the signs of risky use. And there is a couple um, uh, phenomena dealing with ph pharmacological issues. One is tolerance, which means that they need to use more and more of the drug to have the same effect. And uh, basically, uh, down at the cellular level, level uh, when they use this drug, and, and it, it applies to actually, not all drugs, but it applies to many drugs, that the body likes to keep the same state. So when the drug has a certain effect on the body and affects its homeostasis, its, its basic um, status, then the body tries to react, to adapt, to, to counteract that. So uh, then like it, it might... Uh, increase the amount of receptors that the drug can bind to, or uh, it, it can make uh, other changes through its uh, secondary chemical uh, messengers. And uh, there's there's a, a number of things it can do to adapt to the drug. So if they need to use it more and more to have that same feeling of uh, euphoria or, or or the other symptoms that they that they want to feel, then that would be tolerance. And the last uh, sign is withdrawal, and this is when when they've been taking it, uh, and if they if they no longer take it, if they stop taking the substance, and they have 
feelings of uh, uncomfortable symptoms, then that would be withdrawal. Now, uh, opioid use disorder can be broken down into either mild, moderate, or severe. So the uh, symptoms that we just uh, uh, mentioned, there's 11. And if you have two or three of them, that's mild. Moderate would be four or five, and severe would be six or more. For to to give Suboxone, you you should have you should have like uh, four or more. That's what the guidelines say. Because if someone has mild, they uh, th they are abusing they are abusing the um, opioid, but they may not be physically dependent yet. So just a uh, a quick note on the magnitude of this problem. There's about 2.5 million people in the in the United States who have this problem, so that's a lot of people. And uh, the majority of it uh, has been related to prescription opioids, as as uh, many uh, many of you all know that uh, opioids was it was it, it was strongly pushed by not just pharmaceutical industry but also even uh, uh, the uh, um, the FDA and other medical societies in the in the in the late 90s they thought that you know it's it's safe to to use opioids so they kept uh, kind of encouraging physicians to 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 give it to to uh, to remove pain they even said pain is like a vital sign. And uh, so that's why it's such a large number. And 600,000 are related to heroin. And as the availability of prescription op opioids is being more and more restricted, heroin people are, are resorting more and more to heroin. So out of this 2.5 million people, there is this unmet, unmet need because there's only 300,000 people who are receiving treatment at opioid treatment programs. There's about 1,200 of these centers throughout the U.S. So 300,000, so a little over 10% are in these programs. These are uh, structured programs where they, they uh, usually they're getting methadone. They could get, they could get buprenorphine there too, uh, uh, buprenorphine plus naloxone, but usually they're given methadone. Now, uh, obviously, that's not enough, uh, and there's some uh, problems with, with trying to get so many people into these treatment programs because a lot of people don't want to go because it's very structured. They have to go there either every day or, every, uh, or like three days a week and so on. So since 2002, there's been opio uh, office-based opioid treatment. And for, for this, you cannot give methadone. That's too dangerous. But you can give buprenorphine, and you need to be wavered. It's, it's only an eight-hour course for physicians, and it's a, a, a longer course for nurse practitioners and physician assistants, I believe. So, but there's still an unmet need. And this is a, a, a graph that's just showing, um, it's, a little, it's a little busy graph, but here there's, there's a the, the um, uh, substances that have caused overdose deaths. And as you can see here, this, this, line, this yellow curve right here, this is actually a basically fentanyl. So you can see how it really just kind of, like a rocket shoots up from like 2013 and it's just, it, 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 it just it's continuing to, to go higher. And fentanyl is very, uh, uh, it's very potent. Uh, it's like I don't remember. It's like a like hundred times or so stronger than uh, than um, heroin, and uh, uh, so just a little bit of it has a lot of effect. So so that's why, it, in terms of the effect it has, it's it's cheap. It's it, it's very profitable to make, and uh, and in fact, a lot of it is being made in Ch in in labs in China, and then they're sending it to. Mexico and is 
coming to the U.S. through Mexico or through other uh, ports of entry. So this right underneath that is prescription opioids, and you can see how you know since the start of this century it started increasing, and right below that is heroin, and you can see how from like 2009 heroin started increasing. Now around this time when people when the medical establishment noticed that, hey, we're prescribing too much opioids, we need to, to uh, be more careful of that, then they started giving less opioids. And then people who already had this disorder, they were resorting to heroin. Another reason why is that heroin is, 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 is quite cheaper uh, than, than prescription opi opioids. And, and, and it's been uh, people who make heroin... Um, they've found ways to make it even cheaper than in the past. And then below that, you have uh, uh, cocaine and then benzodiazepines. And you can, you can see here, benzodiazepines actually, it was very low, and then it started increasing a little bit. And um, actually, a lot of these deaths of, of benzodiazepine is when it's used along with opioids. Um, and then you have psychostimulants like methamphetamine, and then in, uh, uh, antidepressants. It's low, but it's it's still significant. So why do why do we need to give medicine for opioid use disorder? Why cannot we just um, try to uh, use like a kind of like an alcoholic anonymous type of approach and and get the people, help them to detoxify from, from opioids and, you know, uh, kind of help them through the withdrawal stage, which is not like, you know, withdrawal stage could be, uh, it, it's a, it, it could just be, you know, uh, days. So why, why do they have to keep taking it? I mean, th there's like another, besides the acute withdrawal stage, there, there's, they have, there's other symptoms too, but, but the really the big problem in the acute stage it could be just days, so why not just you know help the people withdraw from it and then tell them stop using it? Well, there's a there's a pro, we have this reward circuitry in the brain that makes us do things. You know we have to do things. We have to eat food, uh, and uh, if we didn't have this, if, the, if we didn't have these circuits, then you know since since time memorial. We, uh, time immemorial, we wouldn't be doing what we have to do to 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 stay alive and to uh, uh, for the generations to continue. Uh, and there is this misconception that people who have this disorder, it's it's purely a function of lack of willpower. Now there is this kind of move. There is this kind of uh, movement. Uh, in the uh, academic uh, addiction medicine community that is saying that, no, this is not an issue of willpower at, at all. I think that's, that's going a little bit ex extreme. I, I think there is some component of that because uh, if people didn't initially take it, uh, then they, they wouldn't be in this problem. I mean, if you don't take this substance, by definition, you won't have this problem. And even people who did who, who did take it because they were prescribed it, uh, you know, they, they, uh, not everyone falls into this disorder. So I think there is some issue with that. However, once someone gets this problem where, you know, they're meeting uh, two, or, two or more uh, of the symptoms, of the 11 symptoms that you remember, uh, especially if it's moderate or more, then it's very difficult, like the vast majority, like over 90% of them cannot uh, fix the problem on their own without, uh, and most of them without medicines, because it becomes like a disease on its own. So um, I was talking about the reward circuitry, and there's a key, 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 uh, key neurotransmitter that's involved, and this is dopamine. And this is involved in, uh, all, in everything that gives pleasure. Uh, before, they used to just call it, like, this is the pleasure molecule. And it's, it's actually much more complex than that. 
And now they're thinking it's dealing more with the anticipation of pleasure rather than pleasure, and it's even more it's even more advanced. Uh, so we don't we can't exactly say you know the human the brain is the most complex thing in the universe. So we can't exactly uh, delineate the effect of dopamine, but we know it's associated with with activities. So like um, so as you can see here like. Uh, food, sexual activity, and so if you see here, the these substances they produce more dopamine than food and sexual activity. So you can see how powerfully it is. Now there's thousands and thousands of tens of thousands. I don't know how many compounds, uh, chemicals, um, that that people are, are aware of, and only a small, very tiny percentage of them. Uh, actually, um, release dopamine, and 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 those compounds are the ones that cause people to have substance abuse disorder. So you have cocaine and uh, these are prescription opioids. You can see heroin, and the reason why heroin is higher is because it it, it can reach the brain quicker, and uh, methamphetamine is is even higher. Now I believe the, this is in um, was done in animals. But to some ex but but you know we're we have a, a similar brains, so uh, it's it's going to affect humans too. Now there's a state there's this, an addiction cycle. So because of this issue with uh, the dopamine and the reward circuitry, people start getting occupy uh, you know preoccupied that they want the substance, then they binge on it, and then they realize it's a problem, so they stop taking it. But then when they stop taking it, <coughs> um, then they start getting withdrawal. So they start feeling sick. So uh, there's this misconception that people keep taking it because, oh, they just want to keep feeling high. They just want to keep having the euphoria. But actually, uh, for for majority of them, it's because they have be the tolerance has increased to the point where actually it's difficult for them to feel high. Uh, if they if they take enough, they they will feel high, but a lot of times they will they need to take so much that they will actually die from it. They will overdose because it stops uh, you know the opioids. They also depress your breathing, the uh, respiratory drive in the in the lower part of the brain. So um, so they they people don't want to feel sick. They don't want to have that those withdrawal symptoms. And when you feel sick, you can't function. You can't go to work. You can't do stuff at home that you need to do. So then, then they, then they're like, well, I can't, I can't keep feeling like this this way. And then they, they, t they take it again. So then they, you keep having the cycle. Now they could, if if they don't take it for, you know, a certain number of days, then then they would get out of the withdrawal. But then they still have these, uh, like in their memory, and they still have it in their brain, like these, like when they have any cues, like they're with friends who are taking it or or they're stressed, they know that, hey, when I'm stressed, this helps me. Or when they want to celebrate, hey, this is the way I can uh, really feel, you know, like I, I can celebrate. So it's, uh, they're, they've associated so much that it's very difficult for them to get out of this, this cycle. Now, th um, this is a graph that's showing, this is a graph that's showing that People who are deta who have detoxified from from uh, buprenorphine naloxone that uh, that they're more likely to have problems with their urine, uh, meaning urine showing that they have you know that they have relapsed, that they have taken opioids. So you can see here how um, this line. Uh, are, are the people who are who have been taking buprenorphine naloxone, and you can see how it's substantially higher than than the ones who who just stop you know who just stop taking it. So that's because they okay, they stop taking it, but then they relapse. And actually, when they stop taking it, some of them immediately relapse. relapse. So. Uh, I just want to say, in jail, there's a lot of people who take who start to, who take the, the heroin. They take it like 
like right after they come out of jail. I mean, people, the police officers have found people like in the parking lot right out of jail, like the day they came mm-hmm. out, that they're dead in the car because they took it. And a big problem is that people, people, uh, they, they've been taking a certain amount, and then they think that they could still take the same amount after they stop. But uh, if they do that, they'll die because. The amount that gives them euphoria, they have become, uh, they have have they have tolerance for that. So they cannot take as much as they did when uh, when they started. You know, on the first day when they ever took heroin, they they have to take more than that to feel that high. But but the re- respiration, the the part of the brain that makes you breathe, that has lost its tolerance. So that's just become like any other person. So. Uh, so if they take the amount that they want to feel high, like they felt high before, uh, that will stop their breathing uh, because the breathing has become normal. The I mean, the drive for breathing has become normal. So people who have who are addicted to opioid painkillers, they're 40 times more likely to be addicted to heroin. So this shows you that. Uh, you know, even if someone who has not been taking heroin, that they they are very prone to taking it if if they can't get their uh, opioids. And this is a this is just showing how potent fentanyl is. And this this is fentanyl. This is carfentanyl. I don't know how good this is projecting in the back, but if you take this much of heroin, the person will die. I'm sure this is a very tiny thing. Uh, but I'm, I just made it big just so you can see. So you can see here, like, fentanyl, you could hardly see how much fentanyl is in this. And then carfentanyl, it's like, like a, looks like a few grains. Carfentanyl, actually, they use it to bring down elephants, uh, uh, like, in the wild. So they, uh, so you can imagine, you know, how powerful that is. Now, a lot of the people who are making drugs... Uh, making um, fentanyl and all this uh, for profit, so you can you can you can see how they're making so much money because they just have to make that much of fentanyl and that will be so that will count so much uh, heroin, and they could and then uh, and they're mixing fentanyl with it. So that's why you remember that graph where so many people are dying from fentanyl. This is like you know like fifty thousand people a year. So that's because uh, uh, when people are buying it from the street, the heroin is mixed with fentanyl. So this is just a uh, this is just indicating on the on the x-axis. This is uh, h- how much uh, is the rate of opioid use disorder in a given state. Each each of these dots is a state. You know, one of the fifty states. So as you're going further out here, that means oh these states like these states over here they have really big problem with the worst problem with opioids. I mean all of every state has a big problem. But like you know, like like these states, like uh, um, you know Arizona, West West Virginia, that's probably the worst in the whole U.S. Oregon, Indiana. Now, with the y-axis, that this is how much uh, provision there is for opioid uh, medication-assisted treatment. So this is this line. Uh, the states that are above this line, there's only, there's only a small number of states where they're having somewhat adequate uh, amount of uh, doctors who are providing this, doctors or nurse practitioners or physician assistants who are providing buprenorphine naloxone. Uh, and actually, in Massachusetts, they made a law that every single physician has to be uh, wavered in, 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 uh, in providing this. But Michigan is over here. See, we're below this line. So we don't have enough... Um, enough accessibility, availability for this, so uh, yeah, so it's a problem. People can't people can't get the treatment they need, and uh, an, uh, this is another graph that's showing that this is the um, treatment gap. So people who have hypertension, seventy seven percent of them are receiving treatment for hypertension. People who have diabetes, seventy three percent are receiving treatment for diabetes. With uh, depression. Now, for addiction, 
only like about 10% of people who have addiction uh, are meeting this. I, uh, this. I think this is not just opioids, but obviously the majority of this will be opioids. I mean, alcohol will be another huge portion of it. So the majority will be alcohol and opioids. But only only like 10% are, are getting treated for it. And I just want to mention, like, alcohol, if someone withdraws from alcohol, they could abstain from it. And then if they relapse, if they take it again, then uh, almost always they won't die because, you know, they, they won't, they won't like, uh, overdose. So that's why you can't, you can't use the uh, alcohol model with, with uh, opioids because with opioids, you'll, you'll shut down the breathing. <clears throat> Okay, so this is a uh, this is a, a graph showing the problem specifically in Michigan. So you can see how again, <clears throat> uh, like right when 2000 started, we started increasing in the U.S. And in Michigan, like right around 2012, it's starting shooting up even higher uh, than than the average in the U.S. This is from CDC, and this is a uh, another. Uh, this is a map showing the, the dark blue. This, is, this isn't clear, but Michigan is one of the dark blue. And this is the ratio of buprenorphine provision to opioid uh, deaths. And uh, if it's dark blue, that means, you know, you need more physicians and, and, and nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants providing buprenorphine, the more, uh, the more deaths there are. But... The dark blue is indicating that that ratio is 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 not good in Michigan and a few other states. And this is another. Uh, this is also showing um, a similar thing, but it's according to overdose deaths. Now, uh, okay, so we have actually three approaches for people who have opioid use disorder. We can either give them, a, uh, and I'll go into this, uh, 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 I'll explain this. You can either give an agonist, a partial agonist, or a antagonist. And these are terms used in physiology. An agonist is a chemical that binds with the receptor. So, you know, like if you can imagine a cell like a, uh, uh, a, 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 like a balloon, of course, it's uh, it's very complex, it's like a city. It's, uh, each cell is like a, it's like you know New York City or something uh, uh, in terms of its uh, intricacy. But outside the cell membrane, you have these receptors for different things. You know, like you have like uh, re insulin receptors, so we get sugar, so we get uh, we have energy to to do. The cells have energy to do what they want to do, and and receptors for many things. So. An agonist is a chemical that binds with a specific receptor. So, um, a opioid agonist are uh, uh, are those uh, that that bind with the receptor and actually activate it. So, so you need two things: you need to bind with the receptor and you need to activate the receptor. So that's an agonist. And an example of that would be methadone. Actually, all the drugs of abuse, you know, oxycodone, hydrocodone. Uh, you know, all of them, they're all agonists. They're all binding to the receptor and they're activating. I mean, why else would someone want to use it? So a partial agonist also binds to the receptor, but it, <clears throat> it doesn't activate it fully. So you don't have that full euphoria uh, as you would with the, with the agonist. And, and I'm going to go into that a little bit more. Even though buprenorphine is a partial agonist with respect to Euphoria, it is not a partial agonist, the, and most people don't know this, in terms of pain. In terms of pain, actually, it does help pain like as good as other opioids. And, uh, okay, that's interesting, but um, uh, it get, it's a little c complex. Now, the antagonist is a chemical that also binds with the receptor, but it doesn't activate it. An example of that is naloxone and naltrexone. You probably heard of naloxone, uh, also the brand name um, Narcan. Like if someone has overdose of, of uh, opioids, and, uh, and if you give them the 
uh, naloxone, it acts really, really quickly, and it will, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, make them like uh, breathe again and stuff. So that's why we we want people to have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, ready at hand in case they have to use it. Now, trexone is also uh, the same thing as naloxone, but it 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 doesn't act as fast. Okay, uh, so what's the ideal medicine for OMT is opioid maintenance therapy? Basically, like we want to, you know, people to have this therapy for for the long term. What would be ideal for that? Well, we don't want it to be re required. You don't. We don't want it to be. Uh, uh, be required to be given through IV because obviously that's not practical uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You want it to have a long half-life, meaning that you want it to stay in the in the blood for a long time. You don't want to because then if it's not if it's not having a long half-life, you have to take it more and more often uh, throughout the day, and that's not convenient. And you're having a lot of ups and downs. And you want to have minimal side effects. You want it to be safe. And you want it to work for a lot of people who have this disorder. So, so a couple good agents for this is buprenorphine and methadone. Now, methadone, you know, we give it at those uh, opioid treatment programs. But buprenorphine is safer than methadone. Uh, methadone can kill people. Actually, a lot, a lot of people who uh, who start taking methadone like in the first like month or two, a lot of them actually die because they don't take it as as they're supposed to take it, and they, if they take too much, then then they die. Uh, so again, it's an agonist. You know, you, you can have full activity with it, uh, but that that's why because people die, you have it you have it at those restricted centers. But buprenorphine is much safer. Actually, uh, as far as we can tell. Not one person has ever died from buprenorphine uh, just by itself. Now, if you take buprenorphine with either benzodiazepine or if you take it with alcohol, and especially if you take all three, but even if you just take it with, with either benzodiazepine or with alcohol, then there have been some deaths with that. Um, but still nothing compared to, you know, like methadone or through uh, other uh, opi opioids. And it's uh, again, it's more convenient than methadone, because you now this is a, um, a so partial agonist. So you know the effect in terms of euphoria is, is up there, uh, euphoria and res respiratory uh, depression. So the full agonist eventually it'll reach the maximum, but partial agonists they. Uh, like buprenorphine, and there are there are there's hardly any there's buprenorphine. I think there's pentazokine is another one, but for some uh, reasons we don't use that. Uh, uh, pentazokine, I think it's not it's not a, it may not be a, a pure partial agonist. But anyhow, this is the one we use, and you can see here it doesn't have the full effect, and because it doesn't have the full effect, person can still breathe. You know, they don't die even if you even if you take it in a, a maximum amount. It'll plateau out. Now, antagonists, you have no effect from the opioids, uh, but uh, it will block the receptor. So these uh, these agonists cannot come to the receptor. You know whether it's oxycodone or hydrocodone, you know, Norco or oxycontin or whatever, they can't go to the receptor because the naloxone is bound to it. But this is another uh, similar thing. This is. Uh, the euphoria, and you see, this is heroin, and you see how this is, there's this big peak, and um, uh, methadone, you know, it can also get to that maximum level, but buprenorphine, it gets to, to, to like, like midway, and then it, it, it plateaus out. Again, this is naloxone, you don't have any euphoria with it. Now, suboxone, basically, uh, uh, um, it, it it became available because of this federal legislation uh, in in 2000 uh, called DATA and uh, it's it's an acronym it's uh, it's um, I forget what it stands for but uh, uh, anyhow so 
uh, suboxone, it, again, it's a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. And the main medicine that works in, sub, in suboxone is buprenorphine. But the reason why we give naloxone is because some people who, who want to get high, they instead of taking the medicine as they're prescribed, they dissolve it and then they, they inject it. And then, you know, that goes right to the brain. But if you do that, naloxone will be will stop that. Now, if you if you take it as you're prescribed and they, they uh, you know, uh, they're supposed to put it under their tongue, sublingual, then naloxone does not get absorbed very well. But buprenorphine does. So that's why it's, it's actually added for safety. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to give that to everyone because of this. You want, you want it to be safe for them, and you want to reduce their incentive to, to divert it, to sell it to others who want to get high. Uh, but, you, but, but people who have uh, a certain symptoms like bad headaches and stuff, then you could you can just give the buprenorphine because <clears throat> so, like a little bit of the naloxone does get absorbed and it, and it, and it could give headaches also if a woman is pregnant then the, the, she's not supposed to get the combination product she's supposed to get the just the buprenorphine because uh, naloxone we don't know exactly how safe it is for for for, uh, for the fetus for the baby now again suboxone is just one of the brand names there's also zubzolf which is not a film. Suboxone is, it, uh, it comes in tablets too, but it, it, it's, uh, it's usually given as, as a film that you put under the, the tongue. Um, and uh, sub, uh, Zubsolve, it's kind of hard to pronounce uh, for me. It's, it's a tablet. And Bunovail is a, uh, it's, it's, this, it's a film that you stick on, the, on your cheek, in, in, the back, you know, in the inside of your cheek. Um, and um, Sublocade, is something that if, if, if the patient is, is not taking this medicine, um, you know, as they're supposed to, like every single day, then you, they, they, you, they, they could benefit from sublocate, which is an injection and subcutaneously, and it lasts for uh, a, a month, uh, up to a month. And probufine is actually an implant, and it could last up to six months. But I think in terms of insurance, uh, uh, coverage and stuff, uh, I think it's not that easy to get sublocated propiofin. That's what I'm uh, assuming. Uh, I may be wrong. Um, now, buprenorphine is a little bit more like why it has, uh, why it, it, wor it, it, it works. It has very strong affinity, so it binds really well to the receptor. And once it binds, it, it doesn't separate from it. Uh, uh, quickly. So it, stay, it stays bound to the receptor. So if it's bound to the receptor, then the medicines, you know, the um, opioids that are being used for, 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 for uh, uh, you know, wrongly, uh, they can't bind to it because it's being, uh, the receptors are occupied by the buprenorphine, but it's, or by siloxone, or I mean, actually buprenorphine. Uh, so uh, now, if someone tries to take heroin on top of, let's say they took Suboxone and then they're trying to take heroin. Now, the, pa the package inserts does say that if you, if you take enough, eventually you will, you will override the buprenorphine. But, uh, but usually, like if they take like the usual amount, then, then the, they're not able to dislodge the buprenorphine. Actually, it's not like things don't dis... Like one chemical doesn't push another chemical off. But there is this sort of like this uh, equilibrium where the chemicals are attaching to the to the uh, to the receptor and they're kind of coming off. They're attaching, they're kind of coming off. But buprenorphine is kind of sticks there, so the other su uh, opioids of, of abuse are not able to bind. So, uh, so there's two issues with it. One is that uh, if if they, if they take heroin and stuff, once they have taken the suboxone then it won't work unless they take too much. Uh, the, and the other issue is that um, um, uh, the other issues, I think I don't have it on the slide, is that if they have heroin in them and you suddenly give them Suboxone, then this is a, a problem. This can cause a precipitated withdrawal because suddenly, you know, they have it and then suddenly you're your your uh, the feeling that they have you, you're suddenly changing the 
their sim their symptoms into making them feel sick. It's like you're driving like hundred like you know you're driving like eighty miles per hour and you suddenly stop to forty like in half a second. You know that wouldn't be safe. So the same way, so that's why we, you can't just give buprenorphine uh, immediately. You have to wait till the patient has has moderate uh, moderate withdrawal symptoms, mild to moderate, preferably moderate. So there, there's some other advantages for buprenorphine that there is less degree of medical complications compared to other opioids, and some of this is a uh, hypogonadism, sleep apnea, weight loss or gain deconditioning, disturbed circadian rhythm. This is not to say that everyone who takes opioids gets all this, but, you know, the longer you use it, you, uh, some people can get some of this. And uh, uh, also uh, other complications, uh, constipation. Uh, constipation is kind of common, uh, so you do get it with buprenorphine too, but it's just not usually not as, as uh, 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 you know, as severe. Uh, there's a... Uh, uh, opioid induced hyperalgesia. This is an interesting thing. Actually, if you if you keep taking opioids, then actually even uh, that uh, for many people it stops working. It stops relieving their pain. That is, it could also lower their uh, immunity. And I was just talking with uh, a family friend. Uh, uh, so so uh, this one gentleman, he's going to have a, a cancer surgery, and. There's evidence that when people are given morphine and, and stuff during their surgery, they have higher metastases later. And that, <clears throat> that's because uh, uh, it, it lowers your immunity. There's natural killer cells that kill the cancer. They're like going all around us and they're, we don't know it, but we're having like little, like tiny, tiny tumors uh, like, uh, all the time. And our natural immunity is, is killing it. But uh, these natural killer cells, they kind of become dormant. When you when you when you're given morphine, and when they're doing the surgeries and removing the cal cancers, then you know like a little bit of it gets it spills into the body, and 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 you know and that eventually metast you know th th that causes uh, metastases. Uh, so uh, that's uh, now is, this is not to say buprenorphine doesn't do any of this. Again, it, it just have it just does it to a less extent. And uh, it's, it's interesting that people who have chronic pain, buprenorphine actually, there's evidence that it's better for chronic pain. There's, this is a, a title of a paper. It says, Conversion from High-Dose Full Opioid Agonist to Sublingual Buprenorphine Reduces Pain Scores and Improves Quality of Life for Chronic Pain Patients. So after patients took sublingual buprenorphine, it doesn't like work like in the first day, it takes like a few days. After two months, patients' pain, mean pain score actually decreased from 7.2 to 3.5. So it kind of became like half. When, and almost all the patients, this is out of 35 patients, uh, 34 or 35 of them mentioned a decrease. And the average, it was, uh, it decreased by half. And this, uh, so, I have, this graph is, is showing the same thing. See, the pain score was like 7 over 7, and then it went down to like 3. Uh, so, uh, so th And if you look at those who had extreme pain, 8 to 10, it went from like 8.5 to 4.5. Uh, and, and then the ones who had like less, like from 5, it went down to uh, like a little over 2. So... Actually, it actually works pretty good for pain. Now, again, you, you don't want to take it with benzodiazepine. Uh, and in France, well, actually, a lot of these people who died, they actually injected both of it. They injected buprenorphine, and they, they were taking this injectable benzodiazepine, which is available in France. It's not available in the United States. So there were some reports of deaths. Um, but again, this this number of deaths is very tiny compared to people who are dying if, if they're not being treated, and that's why the uh, FDA they say that even though it's not good for people to take benzodiazepines and Suboxone together, if someone is taking benzodiazepine, then they should still get Suboxone or you know, buprenorphine and naloxone 
uh, because if they are not treated, their rate of dying from from uh, overdose is much higher than uh, th than this risk, much much higher. So you should have caution, but again, you should not avoid giving it to those who are taking benzodiazepines. You should still give it to them, but you should try to get them to kind of taper off the benzodiazepine. And there's other issues with benzodiazepines now. There's evidence that the people who take it for long term that they have higher rates of dementia. So, okay, um, it's all, just like 10 minutes left. Uh, so this is a, a graph showing, you know, benzodiazepine deaths. Uh, you know, again, benzodiazepine it, it's, uh, with, uh, with any opioids, the number of uh, deaths, it, it increased, um, you know, uh, over time. But the people who don't take uh, opioids with benzodiazepine, you know, if you just take benzodiazepine, like usually they they don't ever die. It's not good for their health. Like I said, dementia and other issues. But uh, this is just a you can't see this really good, but it's it's the clinical opioid withdrawal with, uh, withdrawal scale, scale. And we have to uh, use this when we're going to give buprenorphine because these are some symptoms. You know, their pulse. How, uh, how much they're sweating, their restlessness, the pupil size, whether they're having aches in the bone or joints, runny nose or tearing, tearing eyes, or any a GI upset, uh, if they have a tremor, if they're yawning, their anxiety or irritability level, and uh, if they're having a goose flesh skin, like the, the you know, like when we have, we have the little tiny hairs in our skin, so if you have the uh, pilot erection, like you feel the kind of, uh, those the goosebumps, those, uh, so the, so when you, when they're, when people are having withdrawal from opioids, they'll have some of these symptoms, and there's a score, uh, depending on how, how much you have this, and you add it up, and if you wanted the person to be ideally in moderate withdrawal, I think it could be mild too, but I, uh, ideally, you want them to be in moderate withdrawal before you give buprenorphine, or you can precipitate this withdrawal uh, where it becomes more, you know, uh, severe. Uh, so there's some misconceptions of Suboxone. So, uh, some people say, hey, this is just, you're just, instead of taking this drug, like heroin, you're just taking Suboxone. So, you know, you're just substituting one drug for another. Why are you doing that? And, uh, you know, some family members might say this, and some patients might feel this. But actually... Uh, you know, um, actually this is wrong because, like, let's say you have, um, this is euphoria and this is feeling normal and this is, let's say, you're feeling sick. So like this is normal, okay? So like let's say someone takes uh, like heroin, then they'll okay, they'll feel euphoria the first time, and then if they take it again, they'll feel a little bit maybe less euphoria because as they get used to it, and then they'll take a, they'll feel a little bit less euphoria because you know they're getting tolerant. And I and I don't mean like exactly the third time. I'm just saying like you know if they repeatedly take it, their amount of euphoria will get less, but eventually they'll start feeling sick actually. And then they, they just want to take it so then they don't feel sick. See? They start feeling sick, and then they if they take it, then they feel normal. So that's why a lot, a lot of them start taking it. That's why it's not so easy for someone to stop, because if you tell them to stop, hey, just stop, then, they, then they'll start feeling sick. Now, yeah, after some you know days or several days or so, then they they won't feel sick anymore. But... Uh, they'll they'll still be dependent on it, like I said, like you know they're associating it with with how they deal with stress and and, and, and other uh, feelings. So um, so that's one sub, sub, misconception because when they're taking now when you're taking buprenorphine, it helps you to kind of stay in this area, like you're taking buprenorphine. So, yeah, you're still taking the opioid, 
But with buprenorphine, remember it's a partial agonist, so you don't you don't get into the euphoria stage. You don't feel like you're high. Uh, and again, this is like this doesn't mean 100% of the patients, but the vast majority of them, vast vast majority, they don't feel high. So if they don't feel high, then you know they could benefit from uh, counseling and, and they could function. They could function. They could take care of their families, take care of themselves. It is the just a few more minutes. And uh, uh, some other misconceptions is that it's a get failure willpower, that it's that, that, that you know, oh, you can't go to AA or NA. No, it's still good to go to these groups. Uh, and uh, uh, they could get high in Suboxone. Uh, well, you, uh, you, like, remember, there's like a peak, so usually you don't get high on Suboxone. I mean, some small percentage could, but usually you don't. And or people will just will just sell Suboxone. Now you know we can check their urine to see you know are we seeing are we seeing the buprenorphine in there? Are we seeing the metabolite of the buprenorphine in there? Uh, so we can kind of verify if, if they're taking it. Of course they could try to cheat and stuff, but um, mo most of them won't. Uh, so again, there's this misconception on, on the diversion. Many public health experts have suggested that more Suboxone on the street isn't such a bad thing because it's, it's difficult to overdose on. Remember, no one has been found dead because of buprenorphine, that one person. Now, uh, of course, if you take your benzodiazepine, it, 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 some people have died, but it's still a very small number. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to recommend people to sell it. Obviously, it's a felony to sell Suboxone or, or buprenorphine. But... Even though you know it, it, it can be used recreationally, it, it usually they don't feel the same high. They could feel like you know some some of them could feel a little high, but uh, now uh, you but usually they're just feeling normal. Now uh, uh, you know one pro prosecutor in Vermont, he actually stopped charging drug users even if they're possessing Suboxone like um, like on the street stuff. He stopped. Um, prosecuting them because he's like, hey, this is, I mean, they're, they're doing this so they don't take heroin. If they take heroin, and that has fentanyl in it, they'll kill them. But if they're, they're buying, if they're taking Suboxone from a friend, you know, then at least they won't die. And actually, a lot of people who come, uh, we ask them, hey, uh, are you familiar with Suboxone? And actually, a lot of them, they, they took Suboxone, like on the street. So that's actually, in a way, making them, hey, this works for me. This makes me feel better. I want to get this treatment. So in a way, it's kind of like marketing for, hey, this is a good treatment for you. Um, and, uh, you know, and this one uh, director of addiction clinic in Pennsylvania said that most of the people who are buying it on the street, they're not for, buying it for the high. It's, the highness isn't there. They're buying it really because they just don't want to be sick. So is it a cure or full treatment? Well, it's not a cure because, you know, you have to keep taking it. And uh, uh, it's not, um, I don't have time to talk about how, uh, how how long they should take it, but it takes like 18 months to two years for the brain to to heal. It's actually like, it's like, it's like a brain damage uh, actually happens uh, uh, if, if, if you're addicted. And it takes like 18 months to two years according to functional MRI to seeing like improvements in the brain. But even after they, even after the brain is cured, if people stop taking, like 15% of them will still relapse after two years, uh, because like say their mother died or something, and then they'll they'll if they take heroin, then they'll fall back into the addiction. So some people may have to take it, you know, for life. But this is not to say everyone has to take it for life, and and that that's a whole other, uh, uh, you know. Controversy: Which should they take it for life or not? And again, it depends on person by person. Uh, and it's not even a full treatment because you you know the uh, ASAM's definition. This is ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine. They're the the experts, and they say that it's a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. And dysfunction in these circuits lead to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in individual pathologically pursuing reward and a relief by substance use. Okay, so suboxone, uh, buprenorphine is only helping with the biological. 
but you also have to treat them with the counseling. And actually, according to the Data 2000, which allows people to give uh, an opioid, because, you know, from 1919, like 100 years ago, it became illegal for doctors to give opioid. But they changed it in 2000. They said, if you have the disorder, you can give it. But you have to give it if you're also able to give the counseling. So, okay, so biological, psychological, you know, social, we want them to, you know, be involved with their families and, and, and friends. And spiritual, I mean, if people don't have this sense, like, well, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? You know, they don't have, like, they're not thinking of the meaning. Then they're going to eventually relapse because, you know, uh, people, if, if they don't have higher higher things that, that, that give their life meaning, then they're going to go for, like, you know, this uh, um, instant gratification. Now, this is just how to put it. You put it under the tongue, you know, it looks, looks like a gum. This is a film. And uh, this is a uh, Suboxone again, and uh, so uh, sorry, there's no time for questions, but uh, you could still. I mean, it's 9:30, but but does anyone have any questions or? Oh, sorry. No. no? Okay. 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 Well, I want to thank everyone. Uh, I thank. I want to first of all thank. Uh, uh, Dr. Shaw, that uh, you know, I, I'm here. I, this is a very rewarding uh, profession to help these people with this problem, and um, you know, it can mean life or death for a lot of people. And and thanking also the executive staff who I also spoke to before coming here. You know, Ali Nader, uh, Atif, and uh, and I want to thank you all for you know, it's a team effort. You can't you know treat the patients by you know just. You all have to work together, so I want to thank you all for helping with this, and, uh, and and thanks for attending. It's it's longer than usual, but I appreciate your attention. Yeah. Thank you.